Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. I'd like to call this informational meeting of Tuesday, June 15th, 2021 to order. Our first item up today is council remarks. Any councilor remarks? I could. Councilor Starr. Yes, thank you. And I'm not sure exactly why I did this. Well, I know why I did this, but I went out and maybe this is more bragging than anything, but I am now an official member of the Multicultural Center Board of Directors. So the city funds the uh, program and I thought it was really an important part. Uh, this past weekend they had their uh, multicultural festival and had, I wouldn't call it record attendance, but uh, similar to what it was many, many years ago. So I think the weather has a, a huge uh, a difference in the, the turnout, but they uh, had a successful fundraiser and there will be much more coming from the Multicultural Center with their new executive director. And uh, there'll be a lot of things coming forward. So it'll be, they're, they're gonna be lucky to have me. Congratulations. <laughs> other other council remarks? Seeing none, we'll move right into presentations. And before we start, I'd like to remind everybody that we do have a hard stop at 5.30 for public comment. So we'll move right into the USD Discovery District. Bob Munt has a presentation. Well, good afternoon, counselors. Uh, thank you for allowing time uh, to talk a little bit about a project that um, we are working with the USD Discovery District on. Um, um, really um, trying to take a look at the Discovery District and how we might be able to play a role and kind of cranking some of the activity and stuff out there right now. We've had a couple of opportunities over the last um, few months, few years um, to, to take a look at what we need to do on this. So I, if it's okay with you, I wanna walk through this presentation with you and just kinda talk about some of the slides and, and offer it up um, to you for some discussion uh, moving forward. We're still um, in, in the stage of, of planning some of this stuff and so the, the great details aren't there yet, but uh, we certainly wanna make you aware of what we're talking about here. So. Um, the Discovery District, um, uh, let me see here. It's the right arrow, right? There we go, okay. So just a, a short history. Um, a university center was established uh, about 2001, technically. Uh, it's currently managed by the University of South Dakota. Most of you know where it, where it is, kind of on the northwest. Uh, side of, of Sioux Falls. It was a partnership between Forward Sioux Falls, the City of Sioux Falls, uh, the South Dakota Board of Regents, and then GOED. Um, it includes the Community College for Sioux Falls. It includes the USD Discovery District, uh, and then the Graduate Education Applied Research, or the GEAR Center, um, out there as well. And Dan Ingebrigtsen is with me here today, uh, representing uh, the college today. Um, we started with shared goals. What are, what are our goals in this thing? It was to foster innovation-focused economic development to keep South Dakota graduates in the state, to strengthen the region's capacity to support, grow, and attract innovation-based bioscience companies and high-tech businesses resulting in high-level jobs and the salary ranges of you know, 68 to 70,000, and utilizing that collaborative resource of regional medical centers, regional education institutions, and private sector partnerships to really build on that. So we have have several very powerful um, health organizations here with Sanford, Nevera, uh, SAB Biotherapeutics, and a few others um, that are really starting to show up on the map as far as the bioscience and biopharmaceuticals portion of this. The space out there right now exists with three buildings. Um, you are aware of that. This is kind of what they look like. Um, it includes the Gear Center and affiliated startup companies that are out there, classroom space for USD, SDSU, some of the other universities. Joint meeting spaces, USD offices, as I mentioned, the Community College for Sioux Falls, the USD Biomedical Engineering Program, which sometimes isn't that well known, but is getting to be a lot better known under Dan's leadership. We've got several graduates. We'll talk about some numbers here in a minute. And then the Tech Readiness Acceleration Program, or the TAC program, uh, which works with accelerated technology and incorporating that into businesses that we have here. So it's headed by, uh, headed by Dr. Ingebrigtsen. Uh, we have 47 undergrad students there, 20 master's degree uh, and PhD candidates. It fills up about 22,000 square feet out there. Um, seven new biotech startups have graduated and formed there. 
um, and it populates really the Sioux Falls biomedical industry. So again, those graduates are going to places like Sanford, so like Avera, like SAB Biopharmaceuticals. So we're keeping those kids here, uh, I shouldn't say kids, those graduates uh, here. What we run into now, though, is that as we start recruiting bioscience companies, we really have very little adaptable space to show them. That center out there as it exists today is pretty much full. We've got a few small spots for some startup companies, but we end up, end up referring them to other lab spaces, so to the Avera lab space, to the Sanford lab space, and as you know, both those uh, organizations are growing, their research departments are growing, they're starting to fill up their own space, so their ability to lease that to companies that we might, be, uh, might come in are becoming less and less. And so what we really need is some adaptive space to really fit those needs, uh, the proper ventilation systems, uh, compliant rooms, clean rooms, all those types of rooms that aren't in your typical building, right? So we have to specially design those for that uh, in order to propel that, that lab space uh, that they need. Um, what we feel today is that it's really time to create that competitive shell space that is flexible enough so that we build it out uh, to those clients. They can actually walk into that building, take a look at what we're going to have, take those letters of interest, turn those into letters of intent, which intent uh, we then turn them into uh, actual leases for that facility and build out the program to fit their needs. Some of the prospects that we're working with, as you know, we can't tell you the names of the prospects, but we kind of give you the fields that they're looking into. And by reading through some of this, certainly, um, you know, you can see these are the biopharmaceutical companies. These are the bioscience companies. Many of the terms in these things I can't pronounce, so I'll just let you kind of read through there uh, as far as what those are. But they are the high-tech types of bioscience companies that we see um, coming out of places like USD and others. Um, these are the types of, of, of future fund or future uh, programs that we would see coming into those facilities. And, and where is this interest coming from? What we've been tracking and monitoring is, you know, where do we see the flight of these companies? And you can read through there, but for the most part, they're coming from some of those hot spots uh, for biosciences. And the reason they're coming here is because it's getting so expensive there to operate in those particular locations that they're in, that they're looking for new, creative, energetic space that they can come to. They're looking for new labor pools. They're looking for, you know, new quality of life, if you will, in some of those places. And so we're getting a lot of um, interest from those particular companies. Many of them are smaller companies kind of in that research and development stage, but that's really kind of what we're looking at uh, in this particular area. So the partners that we put together, the Sioux Falls uh, Development Foundation, Discovery District, uh, ISG and Journey have come together to kind of form uh, a group that's kind of looked at what can we do out there to make this a little more um, palatable, to make it uh, take this to the next level. So what we've come up with is a concept of a 50,000 square foot shell research facility, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in partnership with those people that I did, just mentioned, our target really is, uh, we believe we can create up to 250 jobs there in this particular site uh, of those high paying biomedical jobs. And right now the average salary in that area is about $68,000 a year. Tenants will commit to the building they can see. As I mentioned before, it's hard for a tenant to commit to a building that's just on paper that they can't really see and that we, you know, we talk to them about, well, we think we're going to build this, but we're not sure how we're going to do that, but trust us, we'll have a building there. In this case, we can have a building that's adaptable, that's able uh, to, for them to move into, and it helps to catalyze the rest of the research part, too. We've kind of been in a holding pattern for various reasons over the last several years, and we think that kind of this next impetus can, make, uh, can push that forward. So this is kind of the site, uh, if you're, I'm sure you're familiar with it, this is kind of the roundabout uh, that's out at the Discovery District right now. You can kind of see the three buildings that are already there. Um, it's actually the southeast corner of that particular uh, roundabout that we're looking at putting this building. And so you see the yellow uh, outline of the building that's there along with the parking lots and then potential other buildings on that particular site too, whether they're extensions of the existing or extensions of the new building that we'd be proposing or separate buildings as you see on the far east side of that. That would be kind of the next uh, phase that we'd be looking at uh, in this project. This is an artist rendering, again, of what the site or the building would look like from the outside. Again, trying to make it kind of that, that, that high-tech look, that, that look that everybody wants to be in, you know, that they want to bring their clients to, so it really fits in with the surroundings around that as well. Um, we would build out the front part of this as a common entrance space, if you will, to really be appealing, and so people would come in there and, and be able to kind of see this finished out space and what it could look like if they were to, to come in there. 
And then we would leave the rest of the building basically open. So it would be just, as I said, a shell building that could be redesigned to, again, um, the tenant specifications, whatever it is that they need, whether it's five, 10,000, 20,000, whatever it might be, we can design that space and build it out basically to fit their, their, uh, their needs. But again, we'd have a physical facility that we could actually have on the ground that we could show them um, and make sure that they knew exactly where they were going to be. Another rendering here just kind of showing both floors uh, open for space. So we'd have roughly about 45,000 square feet of, of usable space. If you take some of the common area and stuff out, about 45,000 square feet of usable space. So that's the concept that we're kind of um, working towards right now. And um, we wanted to kind of get it out in front of all of you to take a look at that. We're still working through uh, some of the financing and stuff with that. We've got some really good ideas, I think, on the table. We want to make sure that you know, as the city kind of looks at how they might be spending some of their stimulus money, that this might be something that's on the table for that. Um, we have a lot of work to do as far as uh, with our developers, potential developers, um, putting those numbers together as we have laid out here. So uh, we're talking with a, a couple of different developers at this point in time to kind of see what that's going to look like. We want to work through that uh, again. So um, I wanted to, again, get this out on the table to you guys. We want to get this moving. We think the sooner the better uh, on this thing. But like I said, we've got a few things to work out um, on the financing part of this, and we want you guys to be a part of that. So with that, I'll kind of open it up for questions um, for anyone. I know, Councillor Sale, I've been working with you on this kind of on the back side, so I don't know if you have any more comments on that. Questions? Councillors? Councilor Erickson. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. I think this sure. is good, good information. And I think what is, uh, it's, it's no secret, I've been supportive of the USD Discovery District for many years, um, as well as pretty much the council the whole entire time. Um, I think what's really key for me is that we as a community have to diversify our jobs. We can't just focus on manufacturing jobs only, or we might be a neighboring city not far in another state that has struggled because they only focused on said right. manufacturing. I think we all know who it is without saying. Um, but I think it's so important to diversify our economy and our jobs. And, and these are high paying jobs. These are great jobs. Um, and it's also another industry within our city. And so I'm excited. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And so I know it's been frustrating over the years because people want to flip the switch and they want to see change immediately. And it just doesn't happen that way with these kinds of facilities. But the fact that um, Dr. Engelbertson, I always say your name wrong, I'm sorry. Um, the fact that you're still here, you're, you're really pushing forward with um, the educational component is key too. Uh, oftentimes we lose people to other neighboring states as well because we don't have that component. And so um, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to more details to see uh, what comes and hopes that we can, you know, just set some funding aside to see what we need to make happen for getting this project continued to go. Yeah, thank you for your comments. I, I would just add to that a little bit. I mean, I told this, this body before, our targets are advanced manufacturing, logistics and distribution, biosciences, biopharmaceuticals, and mm -hmm. cybers, yeah. right? So this is a great start, I think, on that biosciences piece yep. of it. And again, we have to start somewhere. Yeah. So this is, I think, a great opportunity for us to leverage the resources we have available today to make that happen. And, and you know, you'll hear more about the cyber piece of this too, hopefully later on this fall. So again, a lot of things in the works right now, but this is now. And again, we're excited about this as well. So thank you. And thanks for being involved in it yeah. too, because it's, it's important to have your fun. leadership. I learn new terms every day. <laughs> I can't say most of those <laughs> either, so don't feel bad. <laughs> Councilor Kiley. Thank you. As I was explaining to this group that's here today, I mean, my career was in science and in biology, so I'm very supportive of this. And the possibilities are limitless when it comes to biomedicine and bioscience and biopharmaceuticals. Um, but I'm going to ask some tough questions. So it, it sounds a little bit like we're hoping, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, is this a we'll build it and hope they come scenario? Do we absolutely have somebody that if we build this, they're going to fill that space? 
I would answer that question is no, we don't have somebody. Um, we have a list of prospects that we want to work. But uh, again, as I mentioned, it's tough to sell um, a facility when you don't have a facility to sell. And, you know, it's easy to, to show them this on paper and say, hey, this looks really good. Um, but until you have the plans in place and you have a contractor in place to start building it and you can go to that company and say, we will have this building operational by this time at this year um, and we will help you with your build out, et cetera, it's really tough to, to talk further with those companies. And I think that's some of the issues we've had over the last year is, you know, we've brought companies to the table. Dan and his team have brought companies to the table, but it's just tough to compete with the Ascent Center in Rapid City and the, the facility up in Brookings and things like that when we don't have the facility to actually show them. So that would be my answer. I, I don't have anybody that's ready to sign on the dotted line. Um, again, I'm hoping once we get through this process of approvals to actually build this facility, we can bring those people back to the table and say, this is our timeline, this is what we're going to do. And a follow-up to that, actually, too. Let's, let's say that we wanted to make sure that we're going to get a definite return on our investment and so that we're not building, putting up uh, a building without assurances. Let's say that the funding, we can assure the funding's there, and as soon as we have you signed on the dotted line, it's going to go forward because the funding's already been authorized for a period of three years, let's say, yeah. at which time the funding sunsets. Would that be beneficial? Um, I would say yes. Um, but I would also say that we are still working through the finances of this, and so it's going to depend upon the developer and what they can work with and how uh, well capitalized they are and what kind of risks they're willing to take and things like that. But I think what we're trying to do is to figure out how can we leverage all the resources that we have here available to us to, to get to the best possible scenario. That may include some type of payback after a certain number of years. It may not. So at this point in time, we don't have those finances worked out yet. And my other question, dealing with space and building, um, our community college, uh, it's been kind of struggling, in my opinion, with an identity. It was first a university. Well, actually, it started right across the street here in what was called the Berglund Center because I was actually taking graduate classes there at the time. And then they built in the current location and then named it the University Center. And I know that there was a great degree of concern from around the state that Sioux Falls was going to overtake Brookings and Spearfish and Vermilion, and I don't think that concern has gone, gone away yet. Uh, now we're a community, we're referring to, our, to ourselves as a, I shouldn't say ourselves, but uh, they're referring to it as a community college so that's why I still think it's kind of, there's no doubt in my mind which way I'd want it to go if I had, if, if I were king for a day, but I'm not. And um, so having said all of that, is there a possibility that there's going to be space available on the existing campus in what we refer to as the community college now that might be vacated? I know that there's a, a group that's going to be discussing, are we overlapping services here in Sioux Falls between the community college and Southeast Technical College and other programs across the state? That's a tough one for you to answer, but well, I mean, I'd hate to, coming from where I'm at, I'd hate to put up a building and now we have other space directly across the road that's available. So I'll, I'll try to answer this and Dr. Ingebrigtsen, and you can jump in whenever I don't speak right, okay? Um, first of all, the community college, the stories that you just mentioned, um, I'm, I've become familiar with that as well. That was before my time, but I know it's kind of struggled to kind of get off the ground, the community college, and how that fits into the total educational system. I know that they're looking at, you know, what are some of the things that might happen with the community college. My direct answer to that, um, Councilor Kiley, would be that the existing buildings 
could be retrofitted to be a modern day bioscience complex, but it would be probably at about the same cost as building a new building there. And it would then eliminate any other programs from the universities going into that existing space as we see it today. So I know Dr. Ingebrigtsen in the Gear Center, those lab spaces and stuff that he has are pretty much full and will continue to be full. I mean, there are spaces that are being utilized right now and, and the space that the community college has right now, it would be very difficult to retrofit those with the clean space that we need. Um, you know, there's a certain, um, there's something that have to, has to happen with the floor so that they don't shake. And I can't remember what the term for that is, but things like that, that would not be in these existing buildings that would have to be in this new building. So I hope that answers your question a little bit better. Well, I, I can understand that fully because we had that debate about four years ago on a facility that we're building here for the city of Sioux yeah, Falls. Yeah. Um, and so I, and I made those points myself. Yeah. Please don't take my questions as no, lack of support for the Discovery District. That's because, why we're here. Uh, but those are questions that uh, I know that I had to ask. Yep. Thank ask, you. Ask away. We're, we're still searching for answers ourselves. So, Thank you. Other questions? Councilor Starr? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Mount, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask Dr. Engelbertson a couple of questions yeah, you that get Bob you off the way. hot seat. Bob, get out of the way. So, <laughs> yes, I'll ask Dan, you. can you come up? Yes, Councilor Starr. Yes, good afternoon. Thank One you. of the things that I want to hear, I want to hear you sell the vision. I, there are so many neat things or cool things, whatever we want to call it, that you're doing at the Gear Center. And I think there are so many people in our community that have no idea what you're doing. But do they have a need? It's not their uh, area. What do your students need that they don't have now? Is it more space? Is it better equipment? Is it, you know, what are, what are you doing that, that we can help you continue to grow and that they spin off jobs and become entrepreneurs as part of their graduate work? How much time do I have? Yeah. <laughs> Um, 530 the, is as far as I get to go. The, the thing they need most is jobs. Uh, a lot of our students want to graduate, want to stay here, but there's no place for them to work. Um, I started the USD's biomedical engineering department back in 2006. We didn't have any space. Um, we ultimately moved into the, the gear center in 2009. Somewhat to your question, uh, Councillor Kiley, the gear center was always envisioned as a place where we had a business incubator on the ground floor and we had the biomedical engineering department on the top floor. While I've spent a lot of years in the university setting, I'm a far cry from being an academic. I've started companies, that's what I like to do. The vision I sold to, to President Abbott at that time with going to the Gear Center was, I want to have places where students can cross paths with industry, those ideas can get born and we can keep those students here. And I'm very proud to say that many of the graduates that we have from biomedical engineering um, are staying local. We've got a couple that work for Alumet, a couple that are at Poet, and, and we've been able to keep some here. But many of them that have wanted to stay here have really had to leave because we really don't have this sort of opportunity for these sorts of great paying jobs. Uh, and so that's what they need is a, is a, is a, is a place to go. Um, from a, my commitment, my vision, um, I grew up here. Literally, the, my, my, my one complaint about the, the Discovery District is I, I grew up on the west side. I grew up on North Marion Road. That was where I went pheasant hunting after school. When I was <laughs> <in> school. <laughs> the, 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 the beautiful waterway that winds through that that we're going to put bike paths along, that was a really great place to hunt pheasants. And well, I, that's frowned upon now, I guess. Um, uh, and, but, but, but I, I went to the original Hayward Elementary, the original Axdale Park, the original Washington High School, went to Augustana College, but I had to leave the state. Uh, and what brought me back here about 16 years ago was the opportunity to do just these sorts of things. I'm fortunate that uh, President Abbott and followed by President Gestring said, hey, Dan, we like what you're doing. Do it and do more of it. And that's, and I said, we need this. Uh, we, 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 you can't sell things you don't have. Uh, so to have space that's available for people to be able to rapidly fit out uh, and go, that's a key part. And kind of back to your concern of competing with ourselves, this is USD both on the Discovery District and the Community College for Sioux Falls. Uh, President Gestring 
leads them both. And so the, the, the space will be managed. I think there has been some work by Senate Bill 55. That how can we better utilize those spaces? And some things that we've talked about is moving things in uh, from the Gear Center. I think we'll look at some federal opportunities to put other resources in there to help support the things that we'll be doing in the Discovery District. So I don't see them as being competing with one another or conflicted with one another at all, but all marching towards that same goal, that same mission, that same vision, which is to keep the graduates from South Dakota here. I, I totally agree. I just want to see more graduates that get more jobs. I mean, it's well, a chicken or egg well, type of thing. Do we make the investment? Do we have to wait till everything's a guaranteed deal? How, how do you kick that first domino over to, or, or maybe it's the second or third, because when I do dominoes, they don't, first one doesn't always catch the second right. one, but you know what I'm saying. So it's, how do you see these type of programs happen in other parts of the country? Is it the government that makes that first you know, or the state that makes that first initial investment. I'm sure it's like if you've seen one, you've seen one. Right. Type that, of thing. That 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 certainly. Uh, uh, well, and just just looking locally, uh, you go up to Brookings. It's been the that was primarily led by a partnership with the city of, of Brookings that really drove a lot of that. You know, the state has obviously participated, but it's been, I would say, uh, more guided by. Uh, city and some of the some of the individuals within the city, Al Kurtenbach and those sorts, that have been been key players there. I do think we want to get the state uh, involved and engaged in this. So there there are certainly uh, have been and will be phone calls uh, to try to get that going as well. But uh, we, if we want to keep our kids, this is kind of how we do it. Thank you. Anything? Other comments. Councilor Jensen. My questions might be for Bob, maybe, and maybe not even questions, but you know, maybe just help me understand. And uh, I wasn't a part of the council at the time, but Foundation Park, right? Yeah. We put that land together, package deal. The state worked on it. The city worked on it. We made that land ready for development, correct? Yes. Okay, and we invested as a city into that project through your organization and Ford Sioux Falls? Yes. Okay. Um, as I look at this project, I look at it a little bit like Foundation Park. And it's a little different because you have, uh, you're going after different targets here, right? We're going after startup companies that don't have access to financing for a long-term building commitment. So they need, a, they need a building to lease. Would that be accurate in saying that? Yeah, and I'm not even sure that startup companies would be exactly right. These have started up. It's just that they're in different phases of their um, research and development and things like that. So many of these have capital to finance their development and research and things like that. They're just looking to kind of, you know, hit pay dirt, so to speak, where they can take their product and, and mass produce it or whatever. And there's different levels of where they're at on that. But, yeah, your concept is ab absolutely correct. So from a financing perspective, someone needs to take the risk and it would be a little bit of the developer in this case or a developer in this case. It'd be, uh, you know, Bob and his group, it'd be USD and, and, uh, and their group all taking a risk on this. We started this project years ago when I was in the legislature, uh, right actually before I came, Councilor Erickson and uh, individuals and Dennis Dugard and President Abbott all got this thing going. The state put in a lot of money out there, so is the city. The state, the three buildings that are out there, funded by the state, right? Correct. They're invested in this property out there, and now it gives us an opportunity to say, okay, let's try Bob's concept, but in a little different fashion. Let's look at it as a spec building, because that's what it's gonna be, and trust in Bob, because I know two things about uh, uh, Bob is once he, puts his mind to something, he gets it done, and he does it well. That's what Foundation Park has done. Can you believe the projects that we've had the ability to accomplish because of the leadership of this city, the state, and your organization? And we know two things about the future. It, it's going to look a little different than it does today. And then the second thing is it's going to be rooted in, you know, in, in our past. What is our past? It's agriculture. It's uh, health care. It's finance, it's logistics. What does bioscience need? It needs all of those things. 
It needs all of those things. And we can be an innovator if we look to help uh, this, this project. And I'm looking forward to it. I think also, like you said and uh, others have said, the details really matter in this. And as we work forward and, and get this thing accomplished, it's going to really set us up for some success in the future. Because I, I don't know if there are 28 lots out there. I think there are probably 28 lots. I think if we get 28 businesses that have the same 250 high paying jobs, it's going to be a big deal. And we're going to be not only keeping our kids here, but we're going to be attracting other people's kids here like we already have, but we're going to be doing it with these different industries. So as we continue to look at the details uh, of which we need to and get n different partners uh, involved in this, we need to show our commitment as a city. And I think that this would be a good way of doing that. So thank you, sir, for your presentation. Thank you for your comments. And I, I would say there is a whole team of people around me, just like you know, and, and I happen to be the face of that, so I don't get all the credit for this, right? So, and I don't take all the blame either. So, um, but to Councilor Erickson's point too, I think you know this is a marathon; it's not a sprint. Um, we this is a type of business that takes a long time to develop and a long time to kind of get on the map. I mean, if you look at how long it took Austin, Texas, to get up on that biosciences map from back in the mid '70s. It's taken a long time for that. So again, I would I would ask not only your support, but also your patience in uh, making this thing work and, and getting all the stuff put together. But thank you for your comments. I appreciate that. Councilor Sober. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, things like this certainly need a vision and leadership. And I appreciate that, what you've shown on that too in the presentation today. Um, and I know that we've all been big supporters of the Discovery District. I know in my time on the council. Um, like Mr. Ingebrigtsen said, you can't sell what you don't have. We need this. Um, he also mentioned getting the state more involved, much as they had been in Brookings. What are we doing to do that? How involved are they now, and how? what do we have to do to... Yeah, at one point in time, um, the state had a commitment out there, and I think with some of the changes with SAB and <coughs> excuse me, things like that, they kind of pulled their funding at that time because it was out of the... Um, the future fund, I believe, and so rather than have that allocated somewhere, they put that back in the future fund with the understanding that we could come back to them at some point in time and talk about how we might leverage them as well. We've also got the ready fund that they've kind of made some adjustments to now that we might be able to look into. So again, kind of my point earlier, we've got to look at all the financing opportunities that we have available here to make this thing work with the developer. When Once we pick that developer, we have to sit down with you guys, with your finance team and everybody and put that together to make sure that it's a win-win situation for everybody involved. So they're, a, they're hopefully a player in this thing. Um, I can't commit them at this point in time. I just like I can't commit you at this point in time, but I, we want everybody to be a player in this thing so that everybody's got some skin in the game. And um, once we you know make this thing a success, we can all celebrate together. Right, yeah, all hands on deck, I agree. And like uh, Councilor Jensen had said, it'd be wonderful to see this take on some of the momentum or same path that we've been seeing recently out at Foundation Park and the visions and that type of thing there too. So anyway, thanks again. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Well, I'll just uh, thank you for your presentation and I will thank you and Dr. Ingebrigtsen and all everybody that's been working very hard on this the last few months. I know we've been throwing some curveballs, but I think that you get the sense of the council that we'd like to see this go forward and look forward to getting to the bottom line and where we have to commit. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks for driving up. Yep, thank you and uh, stay tuned. Uh, more to come. Thank you. Thanks. Moving on to the ever insightful and just the best presentation you're going to get for you interns. These, this guy gives the best presentation of all the department heads. Sean Pritchard's going to give us some financials. Well, there's some high expectations here. And we have one of our finance interns out there, so... I'll hear about it if it doesn't meet the quality standards we've set before us here. Uh, council Chair, uh, Council Members, I appreciate being uh, back here at the Council here for the May Monthly Financial Report. Uh, we've got 10 minutes here uh, before questions, so I'm going to try to get the remote to work.
There we go. All right. Perfect. Uh, so labor force and employment uh, is up. It is up 8% uh, since November of last year. So we are seeing some steady improvements there, but obviously we are having uh, significant labor challenges uh, throughout this and the, the throughout the entire community and particularly in certain areas. But uh, we've certainly seen that as a city in terms of our part-time staffing that's continuing to challenge us uh, going into the summer months of this year. You can see it in our unemployment rates. We're hovering at 2.6% presently uh, compared to 3% for the whole state and about 5.7% for this state uh, uh, for the entire nation. Uh, if you look at our insured unemployment rate for last month, we were again the lowest in the entire country. Uh, and we're achieving levels now that are actually below where we were before we entered into the pandemic. So uh, the labor challenges are certainly evident uh, and that has to come with hopefully improving uh, and, and growing our labor force here over time. Inflation is another thing that we continue to monitor and you can see that that has steadily increased throughout 2021. It's now standing at 5% as of May. It was up from 4.2% last month and up from 2.6% the month before. So a lot of that is being driven by the energy sector, which you can see has had significant increases here over the last uh, couple of months, although it was uh, significantly negative throughout 2020. So it's not surprising to see that uh, up as well. Uh, the food sector, which was higher last year, has at least continued to moderate all other goods. So if you look at, you take food out of it, you take energy out of it, where do we stand? Well, we're standing at about 3.8%. Now, what we don't see there is the impact potentially of the construction trades and what's happening in there. As you're aware from the media reports and, and various discussions uh, with lumber costs and other uh, various resources that are necessary for construction, certainly we have seen the uh, increases there. Now there's some recent data on lumber is starting to show some, uh, some mediation of that and it's starting to go down. So hopefully uh, that will continue because that will certainly put some pressure on our construction trades, which as you can see in the next several slides has been really robust. Uh, throughout this year. But it's also particularly important for us as a city as we continue to bid projects going out throughout this year and into next year. We have significant projects that are on the docket, namely the wastewater treatment facility and the public safety facility as well that will be going out there and, and we'll certainly be watching these resource costs as they will probably have some level of impact on those bids as we go forward and trying to maintain what we've already committed to in terms of uh, what we've allocated for funding and so forth. So. We'll continue to watch that closely here over the next several months and continue discussions about those items. Uh, throughout May, uh, of course, as you've seen in, in various media reports, we continue to have record breaking uh, building values for this time of year as we continue to watch that continue throughout the year. We're, we're at $396 million of building permits uh, through May. Uh, that's tracking about $163 million ahead of last year at this time. That's about a 70% increase over last year, about 44% increase over the year before. So again, very strong growth there. That's being led by new residential values, which are experiencing the largest increase. So we're talking single family homes, townhomes and things of that nature are up about $60 million. So that's even uh, ahead of our new commercial uh, the other interesting piece is this, the second piece there, commercial additions and remodels are up 55 million. So uh, it's not just new that's occurring out there, but there's a lot of activity in terms of refurbishing existing buildings that we have in the community as well and reinvestment going on there. And then lastly, uh, third behind that is of course new commercial values, which were up 42 million. Uh, but in that is a $70 million increase in multifamily. So you're, you're seeing record breaking units for multifamily going on right now. and that's. Uh, kind of covering up some softness that you're probably seeing in some of the office and institutional sectors, but you just have variety from year to year, just depending on what happens to get built. Uh, certainly, the number of new units being issued is a really important indicator that we're watching closely with the job announcements that have been coming, the number of units that are coming online uh, are gonna be very critical for our community to be able to support those number of jobs. So uh, at, through May, we had 412 single family units permitted uh, that's up from 163 last year. And then on the multifamily side, which you can just see is, is really kind of exponential growth, 902 units through May of this year, up 233% from last year. Uh, and that's, uh, we only had 271 units last year. Now we back ended a lot of units toward the, the second half of the year. And so it'll be interesting to see if this uh, level of continue, uh, uh, continues throughout the rest of the year or we're kind of seeing a, a robust first half and we'll kind of see how the second half of the, the year goes. So uh, perhaps uh, Director Eckhoff has more ideas on where that's 
that's trending at this point. Um, as far as uh, sales tax collections, I would say we have some pretty positive news overall in terms of where we are trending here. Uh, as we talked about at the last council meeting, our figures are going to be based on uh, a comparison to last year, and it's going to be very difficult for us to compare ourselves to last year. So if you look at May of last year, we were down 13%. So yes, we're showing ourselves being up 35%, but it's hard to gauge what that really means. So the number I would like to share with you is the one that compares it to 2019. And that's where the city had about a 13% increase over 2019. So when you look at that number over two years, we've, we've grown 13% over two years. It's a pretty good figure overall. Not as robust as we were last month, actually. Uh, we were a little higher last month over 2019, but still a very solid figure uh, when you look at that. And if you look at our rolling 12-month average, we were negative 0.7% at the end of last year. We are now turning positive at 4.8. So you're seeing an acceleration there. Uh, we were negative in sales taxes for a good portion of last year, and so you should hopefully and continue to see that growth in, uh, go into the next several years as well, or the next several months. Um, entertainment tax collections, uh, again, as we talked about last month and, and tried to preempt this a little bit, we were down 50% in entertainment taxes last month, or in May of 2020. We would have to go up 100% just to break even because that's the way it kind of essentially the math works. Well, we went up 125%, so we did actually see growth. But again, let's look at the 2019 number to really tell us what's going on over a normalized year. And from that perspective, uh, we were actually up here 18.6%. Uh, so again, uh, that's a pretty solid figure when you're looking at a comparative basis to a more normal year like 2019. Uh, what's occurring in entertainment taxes? So we just got the industry level data today. And ex as expected, restaurants continued to perform very well. Lodging saw their first positive month since the pandemic, which is they've been trending in a better direction but never hit positive. Drinking establishments were also strong. So again, all of that is leading to strong growth within that entertainment tax sector. Um, so the industry level data, this wasn't in the draft report that we originally circulated, but it was uh, available today, so we're putting it out there. Um, Here's what I can kind of tell you looking at these numbers, at least initially. What are we seeing? Continuing to see really strong retail activity. And we're looking at this compared to 2019 because you can't compare to last year. So we're seeing strong growth in the retail activity. Uh, we're seeing uh, wholesale trades kind of flip-flop for this month. So it had a really strong month last month. Uh, not as strong this month, but manufacturing came through in a big way. So uh, the two are kind of balancing each other out. Uh, overall, there's, there's pretty good strength across most all of the core areas around ours. Uh, around, the things that have been negative in the past, like movie theaters and some of those, they continue to be negative. So the softness of this month was wholesale trade and also some uh, business management consulting. Everything else that had been strong before continued to be very strong. And again, lodging positive for the first time since the pandemic essentially began. Uh, and then drinking establishments and some of those other miscellaneous items also, which had been somewhat negative in the past several months during the pandemic, are starting to turn around. You can see here in the lodging tax uh, kind of supports what I just discussed. Uh, you can see we were down 80% in May of 2020. So essentially there was, it was non-existent for lodging tax. So it's up 521% this year over last year. But again, you can't really gauge on that. But we are actually up about 20% just on the lodging tax piece uh, over 2019. So again, very solid numbers overall in terms of, of what we're seeing there and, and seeing some actual growth uh, for the first time in quite some time. My expectations with lodging, if you talk to people in the lodging sector or you talk with the experienced Sioux Falls, is that they expect a really strong tourism summer, uh, but they expect some softness, softness to come back in the fall uh, because the convention center traffic uh, business travel just hasn't returned to its prior levels. So expectations there. And then on the bid tax, again, same story, uh, very significant growth, but we did not grow over the same month in 2019. So we're still lagging a little bit in response to the bid side. As far as revenues go, uh, we were 46% of our budget collected. And similar to what we said last month, we are taking all of the local government assistance out of this. So you can really just see comparatively where we sit from an operational perspective. Uh, so 46% collected uh, thus far this year, or about 83 million. That compares to about 42% collected last year before we really started getting into deep into those pandemic months. So what is driving that? 
primarily some increases in sales taxes above budget. Uh, we also saw a fairly significant increase in property taxes. Now we don't expect that to, to th we expect that that will clear out by the end of the year. A lot of that just happens to be a timing issue of when people pay their property taxes and when we receive it. So uh, I don't expect that that number won't be uh, aligned with what we actually expected for the budget overall. And then as far as expenditures, we're very much in line with where we were last year. We have about 33% of our budget expended. Uh, this excludes about 10.65 million of expenditures that were related to local government assistance. Those were the dollars that were approved through the Sioux Falls for All initiative. So we've taken those out so you don't see those. It's just a transfer out of the general fund into the sales and use tax fund. So that just kind of throws everything out. If you look just at operations overall, uh, we're very much in line with where we were in the past. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Questions, counselors? Councillor Sober. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good presentation. How much does inflation right now concern you? And um, it just, I was thinking of this now. Growing up in my formative years, about 100 years ago, my dad ran a couple of businesses, and it was in the age of double digit, digit inflation and mid teen interest rates. And uh, I don't know, I'm kind of, that concerns me a bit. We're heading in that direction. Maybe you could give our audience of eager young minds here and me a little reminder of what is inflation and how does it work in a nutshell and why should we be a little bit concerned about this as we're seeing it go this way quick? Um, so inflation uh, is, you know, the escalation of costs over time. And we always want to see moderate inflation. We certainly don't want to see deflation. And that's somewhat of a rare occurrence to actually see deflation also, although we saw it in entry energy costs last year. Um, but one to two percent inflation, steady controlled inflation over time uh, that is with, with, within people's expectations, that's considered healthy and normal. Now we're starting to see some inflationary indicators showing some, some vast increases. And the concerns here uh, primarily, and, and maybe I, I speak a little too honestly about this, but I, I do have concerns that we're not taking inflation as seriously as maybe we could have. Uh, my concern is there is so much, there's so much cash in the system. There's been deflationary tendencies, I think, to the dollar, uh, the value of the dollar, that there is so much cash being put out the door, money being generated from the federal level that's being transferred through a, any number of programs. This isn't really a political statement. It's being done for very specific reasons, but uh, it, it's starting to, I think, churn and drive, and the economy is recovering, and, the, and will it recover faster? than we expected to, and will that lead to those inflationary tendencies? You, you chase that on top of you know, the fact that there's all these production issues that happened during the pandemic where you can't buy certain items, right? So people are chasing the same items with the same dollars. So they have more money chasing fewer items, which is leading to cost escalations. You can see it in the car markets, you can see it in various other markets. So it's one of the reasons why I think we'll have a very strong tourism because as I talked about last month, I think people are going to try to spend money on experiences because they can't always buy things right now because you can't get them. Um, so I, I think that's driving some of the inflation. Now, hopefully, we'll see some of those resources like lumber and some of those some of those jam ups that are happening uh, start reducing that. But it is something I think we'll have to watch over the course of the next six to twelve months. Thanks for that. Other questions? Comments? Councilor Starr. Well, I think the thing I've learned over the years is that as many economists as you have in a room, that's how many opinions that you have by the time we're done. So somebody gets to be right uh, over time when you look back. But, you know, following what the Fed, the Federal Reserve is saying is that they're really talking about inflation being transitory and really looking at is it duration or the magnitude of what it will be, and I'm not sure if it was their term or something else I read, but they were talking about micro uh, inflationary pressures, whether it's lumber and things that are in that short term. And so balancing um, the inflationary worry, because we pay you to be very cautious. I mean, that's a, a big part of your job is to, to keep us on the straight and narrow. But then our job sometimes as policymakers falls into that, what do we do to continue to stimulate so that you don't fall off of that, that cliff when the incentives and all that extra cash stops churning? So not being a, an economist, I know that you're not, but 
I actually have an economics degree. So. Never mind. Then I just. <laughs> <switch over. laughs> All right, then I'll stop now and be. No, um, no, 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 no. But I, what, what I'm looking at from a city perspective and in, in our finances and the amount of cash that we do have, because as a city, we are very flush with cash. We've been given a, a lot of cash to, to invest and to continue to stimulate. But when do we get to that point that we don't need to stimulate or maybe that we need to hold back a couple of these big projects that we have, whether it's the uh, water reclamation, whether it's the um, moving forward with some of the, or delaying because the costs are too high, or there's that micro inflation uh, that causes in, in certain categories that maybe it makes sense to wait a year to move forward with the uh, tr law enforcement training program or some of the street programs. Are we seeing, maybe this is the best way to ask it, are we seeing it in the bidding that we're doing now versus the bidding that we're forecasting? Because the numbers that we get show that a lot of the bidding or at least the public works bidding that we're seeing is kind of coming in pretty close. There's some abnormalities where people aren't touching things. The, the filters for the swimming pool where we didn't get any bids or, you know, some of those things, but are we bumping up our cost estimates or are we coming in where we think we should be in some of those? And when there's a lot wrapped into that. And yeah, I, I think you make a lot of, good points there, and I'll start with the first one is, is it transactionary inflation? I hope it is. I mean, I hope the Fed's right about that. I hope that it's not systemic at this point, uh, but I think we just have to be cautious with that. I think your point made, uh, it, it, as far as stimulative effect, I think we, we make decisions based on what is the best priority to move forward at the right time for the community based on the needs of the community. I think we can overstate maybe our stimulative effect that we can have uh, overall, especially when you see the robust activity that we have in the community already. So as far as, I think we make decisions because it's the right thing for the community at the right time as opposed to worrying too much about, or, or holding back. I don't even suggest we hold back from that perspective. <coughs> um, on the, uh, on the, the bidding side, I guess from what I've seen, and I think you, you spoke to it pretty well, uh, as well, you kind of covered it, is, you know, some of the projects we're seeing coming in pretty good, right? Like a lot of our, uh, I think some of our construction projects, so far they've been okay. Um, we haven't really built, bid a large scale uh, mass construction project to the extent where you're using lumber and some of those trades that have really seen some cost escalations occurring over the last year. Um, but as from the bids I've seen for some of the water projects and so forth, they've been mostly coming in about where our expectations were, some up, some down, but overall, okay, filters, that was an issue. But I think that is indicative. We're seeing fewer bidders come in on various projects, and that's the struggle. You're, you may get one bidder or no bids. You know, we're seeing no bids coming in, and that's, that's a challenge uh, overall. But I think the, the key thing is the type of construction we're gonna be doing, and when you're talking about an equipment-heavy project, because equipment has been hard to to get and projects that entail large uh, capital uh, building type of structural uh, investments, that's where I think they're starting to get a little concerned about what the bidding environment's gonna look like. But again, we could be five months out and we could be looking at a whole different environment than what we are today. We just have to be <coughs> cautious of that. The last thing I would say is, I think you do make an uh, excellent point though in that we should, you know, uh, you all know Tom Huber and he's, he's essentially said, you know, sometimes there can be uh, great savings in patience. And maybe, you know, there's a time for patience because we'll, we'll get a better value for our dollar 12 months from now than we will now. But again, we have to consider all those as we go through the process. You did a much better job wrapping that up than I did, so I appreciate that in a, a much shorter time. The other is, is as we look to invest in the future, what our um, ARPA monies are and what we have for surplus, capital surplus still waiting for us to kind of make some of those decisions. I appreciate the, the administration's been well keeping us in the loop, sometimes more than, than we want in extra meetings and uh, appreciate that part of it. So I wanted to at least say thank you publicly for keeping us involved and giving us a running total and giving us the background of where we're at and giving us an overall picture. So thank you. Yvette, and I, thank I you. apologize about uh, neglecting your education, and I'll make sure that you I know. I never really said it, so nobody knew. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing so, you know, I just have a couple. Uh, Director Pritchard, I, the American Rescue Act money, is that included in this budget? Did, 
It is not, it's not budgeted. It would be budgeted for at the time it's appropriated, so it would be added to the budget then. And since we haven't received any of it, we wouldn't record any of it yet either, so. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, but if we did actually physically receive it, even if unbudgeted, it would show up at revenue. Okay. Actual revenue. The, there were some questions about inflation. Is housing currently considered in the inflation numbers? Um, I'm not a technical expert on how they calculate the inflation number. I would assume that they should because typically housing is 30 to 35 percent of your income for many people is spent yeah. on housing. So you would think that housing would be incorporated at least some semblance of a whether it's rents or some sort of implied indicator for what housing is. I would have to assume they would include that in there. But okay, because I think that, that several of us can attest that housing is. Certainly the price of housing has uh, gone up a lot. But last question also relates to housing a little bit. You talked about 902 residential uh, apartment multifamily. Uh, so each unit, could you, and I'm not sure if this is your area, each unit equates to how many people? Is there a calculation that is generally acceptable to that? And can we no. maybe Do we you know what the average is per unit in a multifamily? You use 2.4 as an average for apartment dwellings? Or for every single family unit? 2.4 for all units, whether single family, multifamily, or town. Okay. Homes. Thank you. That's all my questions. If there's nothing else, I'm going to say thank you for a great awesome. spellbinding presentation, as you always do. Thank you. We're going to move on now to an update on the workforce housing needs. In South Dakota, the interim study committee by Jim David, the city council chief of legislation and policy. <laughs> and council chair, probably the best presentation of the evening. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, report on my trip to Pier last week. Uh, the Workforce Housing Needs Interim Study is one of 17 interim committees authorized by the previous legislature. It is chaired by Representative Roger Chase out of Huron, and the vice chair is Casey Crabtree, who is out of Madison. If you look at the map here, there are 19 total members, 7 senators, 12 representatives. From the Sioux Falls area, we are represented by Senator Jack Colbeck, Senator Herman Otten, Representative Jamie Smith, and Senator Larry Zickman. Their expertise on the entire committee range from realtors, home builders, bankers, landlords, appropriators, contractors, and more. There was also, I'll point out, a similar study back in 2017. All the legislation that did come out of that committee failed, but they are hopeful that they will have better luck this go around. Uh, at the request of council members Christine Erickson and Vice Chair Alex Jensen, I did attend this meeting last week in Pier and heard from several experts and interests, including the first planning district. This is similar to the Southeastern Council of Governments here in Sioux Falls, State Home Builders Association, State Realtors Association, South Dakota, South Dakota Housing, the State Multi Housing Association, and others. So a consistent theme of this meeting was the imbalance of supply and demand, not just in the growth hubs of Sioux Falls, Brookings, Rapid City, and Watertown, but throughout the state, large and small, east to west. Telecommuting has become a game changer, especially for small town South Dakota. So the, the struggles that we are feeling here locally is also hit, felt in smaller communities and other parts of the state. Supply continues to be impeded by a short, or labor shortage, building material costs and delays, and land availability. And the demand is intensified by low interest rates, in migration from other states, and a growing economy, which is really hard, hardly news to anyone, which is reflected by these headlines dating back to the spring regarding the labor shortage, the interest rates, and the migration to South Dakota. So in this committee meeting, 
there was a discussion on what are some of the challenges. What can we solve locally within the state of South Dakota? The inadequate housing stock, not being able to keep up with demand, infrastructure costs of local governments and the home builder, this inflates the cost of lots. Limited land availability, local cities they can't buy sewer and water expansion projects, unnecessary red tape, from both the state and local government. However, Senator Kolbeck did specify that he's not interested in dealing with any lift, late, excuse me, life safety um, requirements in the limited workforce. What I found also interesting, and these stats go back to the spring, is that we have a, a, a vacancy rate, which is fairly minimal in, in the Black Hills, 1.45%, and in Sioux Falls, 6.65%. This is from Spring, I believe there were actually March or April numbers. These are expected to be far less now that it's summer. In 2021, as we just heard, the city multifamily uh, permits have tripled from this year or from last year at this time, which is, again, that demand that is continuing to put pressure on multi-housing. Potential solutions, again, this was a free-flowing conversation, not just amongst those that presented in front of the committee, but also uh, members of the committee. One of the ideas was creating an infrastructure revolving loan fund, reduce the lot cost, have a local match, a 0% interest that balloons afterwards. A comment from uh, Toby Morris, who I know many of you know, was you mitigate the risks, but you don't remove it and try to create incentive for them to pay it off early. Other ideas was expanding TIF for housing, a sales and excise tax rebate, which would need local participation, neighborhood excuse me, neighborhood rehabilitation incentives, possibly using the discretionary formula, expand the governor's house program. Currently, there's a maximum of 400 housing units that they can uh, get out of that prison down in Springfield. The thought is maybe we need to expand it to other state prisons. Another point that was brought up during this meeting was the fact that material costs on the governor's house has increased by 20%. Other discussion was the property tax deed, delinquent property taxes. There's a lot of homes that sit on the, uh, on the tax rolls. They haven't, the property taxes haven't been paid. Expedite that process to get them on the market before they become dilapidated anymore. And then also from the multi-housing association was bringing up the, uh, an idea that has been brought forward on a couple of previous legislative sessions and that's creating a new classification for multi-housing. Currently it's classified as non-ag or commercial, which is basically what is twice that of the ag levy. So next steps. There was a, a common theme through all the, uh, the presentations and amongst the uh, committee's discussion was the need for infrastructure. And so uh, there's going to be an infrastructure subcommittee. Senator Crabtree will chair that. And from Sioux Falls, we do have our uh, district that does uh, that is within the city of Sioux Falls, Senator Herman Ott will be on that committee. Uh, the next committee meeting of the, that full group is gonna be on July 14th in Rapid City. Uh, there is hope that there is going to be an East River committee meeting, uh, hopefully here in Sioux Falls, but Brookings was also thrown out as, a, as an option. Uh, Director uh, Jeff Eckhoff was also present uh, during that committee meeting. And uh, there's interest from Sioux Falls there, but unfortunately there was none on, on the agenda. Happy to answer your questions. Thank you for your report. Councilor Erickson. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jim, thank you. I know originally when Alex and I asked you to go, I know you're busy and we're all busy and we really appreciate you going um, and really just getting all this information. Um, I know when um, Alex and I talked, we said, we should have Jim just give a five minute update. And you obviously knock it out of the park every single time. I wasn't expecting a, a full report like this, but this is awesome. This is great information for us to have uh, and to know what was talked about. And I'm certainly grateful that you went as well as um, Jeff Eckhoff and others from City of Sioux Falls because we have to have a presence <clears throat> there. We have to show this, this isn't just Sioux Falls, this is statewide and it's really, really regional. I'll say it again and again and again. How many people pick their heads up off of their pillows from Brandon T, Hartford, Harrisburg, and come and work in Sioux Falls, or come to eat, or come to a concert, or whatever it is, they spend their money here. And so 
housing looks different, um, that it's not maybe everyone will live in Sioux Falls, but they're going to live in other surrounding communities. Would I love all the property taxes? Absolutely. However, um, it's okay if they live in some of these other smaller communities and still are a part of our region. And so um, thanks for this. I'm, I, I'm not sure who will be able to make it to the 14th meeting. Um, I have family out there, so I might just head out there anyways um, to be a participant in the Rapid City area. But I think it's really, really important that we continue to have a presence there as Sioux Falls. So thanks for this. Great information as always. Thank you. Councilor Neitzer. Uh, do you recall uh, when they were talking about limited land availability? That, that could mean a lot of things, so I'm interested what they might have brought up. For example, the inability to finance the sewering it as a city, uh, inability to purchase it at a cost that's reasonable. Uh, I, what, what, what was the gist of that? Yeah, land availability. It, uh, a lot of communities, and we, we don't really think of it here in Sioux Falls, but a lot of communities throughout the state are at debt capacity or approaching debt capacity. So it's very difficult for them to provide sewer and water to the to expand their community. There's demand. If you look in like Chamberlain right now, there's hardly any any homes available. They are. I'm not saying that they have. They're approaching debt capacity, but many other communities like them are approaching it. And so the consistent theme throughout that meeting was infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Now whether this revolving loan fund would apply to local cities or developers, I'm not sure. I mean, it was uh, one thing I will say about this group. I looked at the agenda, I'm like, I'm not getting out of here by five. They said three o'clock, I'm not getting out of here by five. I think they're done by 3.30. I mean, they kept on agenda, but what was amazing about this group is that it was a free flowing conversation. It wasn't one person throwing out idea and then it getting shot down. It was like, everybody, let's just come with solutions. And that was also unique. It wasn't complaints. And I think uh, Councillor Jensen brought this up either earlier during our meeting with the interns. Don't just bring your complaints forward. What is the solution? And every single individual on this agenda brought forward a solution. Now, whether they go with that or not is, uh, is going to be difficult to say, but uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a great meeting, uh, and I think there was a lot of potential. I'm excited uh, to be there, and uh, I, I slipped out for some lunch, came back, and uh, it, they were just trucking right along. So. What, was there any dis discussion about the significant amount of various stimulus money the state has received and what they could maybe deploy that for, such as helping to maybe build infrastructure yeah. or do some of those things? The revolving loan fund. I mean, utilizing that, um, there was discussions on uh, possible grants, you know, whether a grant would be the correct way to go. But then there's like, we want locals to have skin in the game. We want developers to have skin in the game. Um, and so using those stimulus funds for a project like that, um, I, I'm sure there was, uh, there was others I'm not thinking of right offhand, but using those federal dollars for uh, housing, whether, and there was an, uh, an example in Mitchell, I guess the, I don't know if it was the city uh, or some group had purchased a large uh, tract of land and then actually then tried to develop it. Uh, they talked about some of the pitfalls that they experienced, but now that is starting to take off. Uh, there's a community outside of Brookings, I, I think it was Esteline, that, that talked about a similar program. So um, really, there, there was a, a wide range of options, and, but definitely the federal funds are a key component to that. And that is, I, I think, the optimism that the committee felt that whatever they put forward to the legislature, there is a good chance that it could actually pass because now there's actually money before there wasn't money. Yep. Okay, thanks. Other questions, comments? Councilor Soberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great job, Jim. Um, yeah, I think much like we just discussed with the Discovery District, we need all hands on deck here, and I think that's what a lot of this conversation has been over the last few months. I know I'm on the Accessible Housing Advisory Board. I've been on something like that for a while. Um, a lot of sharp people there. I know I appreciate that uh, Councillor Erickson and Councillor Jensen have started a lot of conversations around town and the communities and getting that kind of feedback. Now we've got it going on at the state level. And uh, like you say, you need people with open box, thinking outside the box, open minds, new ideas. What can we do that hasn't been thought of before? But it sure sounds like from every which direction we're getting the sharpest people around. So that's good to hear. So anyway, good job. I'm glad you went. Other questions or comments? Hearing none, 
Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to the part of our agenda that is public comment. If anybody here would like up to five minutes to comment on anything that we've discussed today, now is the time to come up. Mr. Chair, is there extra intern credit for anyone who takes the three minutes to uh, inform us of what's going on? I think they it, should introduce themselves. I think that'd be great. The ones that stayed around after five yeah, o'clock get should, extra credit. You should get a raise. Give it to Agent Jensen. I, I, I can't. You have no I would authority. love to give them extra credit, but. Uh, I would grant you the authority to do it. Yeah. <laughs> we could keep them here for the overtime. Yeah. Seeing no public comment at this time, I'll move to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>